Hey everyone, this is Rahul with the Alternative Investors Hangout. You can check out my work at altinvestors.com. Today we have a returning guest. He's one of my peers at Wall Street for MainStreet.com. His name is John Manfreda. Thanks for coming on, John. Ah, thanks for having me. All right. In the news last week, or I think it was early this week, Barack Obama said that we need to crack down on oil speculators. But if you actually look at it, like say in like 2009, oil speculators drove the price down to like $20, $35 a barrel. And now they're blaming oil speculators for driving the price up to, let's say, $104 a barrel, which is, let's say, $3.88 on average a gallon across the United States. So where's President Obama wrong in his analysis about oil speculators? Well, there's a lot of things he's wrong about, so uh, <laughs> I don't – it's hard to begin. But first off, uh, it, a lot of this, what people fail to understand is it's a global market. It's not – the U.S. doesn't mainly control the supply and demand anymore. Uh, a lot of countries are – Building up infrastructure similar infrastructure similar to what the U.S. used to have. Oil demand is drastically uh, picking up in emerging markets. The U.S. is using less and less of it. In fact, demand world is worldly is at an all-time high. But well, well, all-time high is probably like a couple of years ago. But it's uh, staying around in the all-time high. And most of it's coming – the U.S. doesn't have uh, – demand in the U.S. is at a, almost a, a low, a big low. So a lot of it's coming from emerging markets. China is uh, – a lot of people who saved up for cars uh, are buying cars now. And so gasoline demand is just cranking up. That's one – not only that, a lot of the cheap, easy-to-refine oil is basically gone. A lot of the new oil, like Canadian tar sands, uh, deep water, you're going to need more expensive oil for it to become economical. Deep water, if oil gets around 60 to 65 uh, percent, a lot of those places, well, deep water drilling is just not economical, so it needs to go higher. Oil needs to be higher for a lot of this investment to be made. It's like the natural gas when it was $16 per thermal unit. A lot of investment was made, and now natural gas is at an all-time low. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is what people forget about speculators is in the 70s, uh, before we introduced uh, speculators or the mercantile exchange, what happened was uh, it used to be OPEC that controlled the oil prices. And there's actually a funny picture. It has sort of the Ghostbuster symbol, but it has New York Mercantile Exchange traders, and it says OPEC busters. And basically the oil producers could sell at any price they wanted, and prices were much more volatile then and speculators were actually known as the saviors. So we need speculators. There needs to be some speculation. Otherwise, OPEC or and well before OPEC's the Seven Sisters, they basically had a monopoly on prices. So it's just ludicrous to blame it on speculators. Wouldn't you also say that Barack Obama and, let's say, Eric Holder are missing the key point and it has to do, deal with dollar devaluation? We see all this funny money creation by Ben Bernanke. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would say, I would say the main reason right now is dollar devaluation. If you look at it, food prices have gone up. Metal prices have gone up. Why wouldn't oil go up? So... Yeah, I would say the value of your dollar is going a lot lower. If you price it in gold, it's at an all-time low. So, so I would say, yeah, that another thing is the thing with politicians is they never want to blame themselves. So they're always looking for a boogeyman. Right now it's the speculators. And that's the thing. Like, this is why uh, – I actually find it laughable when politicians are like, 
Well, let's try this policy. If it doesn't work, we can get rid of it. When has a politician ever admitted, yeah, my policy hasn't worked. Let's just do away with it. So, Right. I totally agree with that. I wanted to transition into the topic about natural gas. You were talking about how natural gas, these prices are really low. And I haven't followed this market as extensively extensively as you have. So why are these prices low? And many people may not understand. They say, oh, these prices are low, and then you have, I think, bond kings like Jeff Gundledge. I may be pronouncing his name wrong. He's saying that natural gas is pretty much gold in 1997 when it was dirt cheap. So can you explain that? Uh, well, a lot of people look at the oil and they think natural gas is a def- is definitely a buy because it's so uh, out of alignment, sort of like the silver-gold ratio. I'm assuming most of your followers are gold and silver bugs. So, But this is different. Natural gas isn't money like gold and silver. It is basically a commodity used for uh, life, life things, energy mainly, heating. And uh, I wouldn't... I wouldn't buy natural gas. I don't think I'm not bullish on the prices. I am bullish on certain sectors. Uh, why natural gas is so low is because of uh, technology like hydro fracturing and other types of new drilling technologies made. We have been able to extract natural gas in places we never thought could be extracted before. Uh, the Bakken Revolution, which is probably the lone bright spot in the U.S. economy, has made us a huge natural gas producer. Uh, I think we're at least not, I think we're we're definitely one of the top natural gas producing nations in the world now. And the funny thing is, uh, in 06, people thought we could never produce. We thought we were having peak natural gas production, and then this new technology came on board, and the natural gas from the uh, Bakken, the Marcellus Shell has just done uh, wonders to the amount of natural gas uh, being uh, put into the market. And so that's why you'll see a lot of uh, U.S. politicians saying we should use natural gas as an energy dependence because this new technology has allowed us to produce so much now. And uh, we're just flooding the market with natural gas. There's a supply glut, a huge supply glut. And combined with the mild winter, demand was uh, pretty low. So, well, not mild. I would say hot winter. Some, sometimes I was wearing uh, T-shirt and shorts. So that's why natural gas is so low. So, and I think it will, as uh, the thing is, uh, when you look at it, UK now, th- the UK thinks they can uh, produce uh, more unconventional natural gas there's investment being made. China actually has is supposed to have 200 years worth of shell gas under the ground, but they don't have the technology to crack the rock, crack open the rock. So they're inviting foreign investment. So the thing with natural gas is in different regions it's different. It's not like oil, where there's mainly two prices, Brent and West Texas. There's a lot of different prices. So. The natural gas in North America is really cheap. It's not like that everywhere else. In fact, in I think some parts in China, it's ten dollars per thermal unit. Unit uh, the U.S. it's like two dollars, uh, or no, I think it's even below that now. So, but the uh, natural gas revolution is definitely going on, and politicians are scared to break it because they're worried about uh, losing jobs. That's why the EPA uh, delayed the hydro fracturing uh, regulations and rules till 2015. So that's why natural gas prices are so low is because of uh, hydro fracturing and the amount of nat gas we can produce. In fact, in North Dakota, there's McDonald's workers that are getting paid $15 per hour because the demand for workers is so great, but, you know, there's not enough people to fill them. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I heard about that, but I think North Dakota, it 
costs a lot more to live in those areas of those booms. But I wanted to transition into another energy source, and it's thorium. And the mainstream media doesn't talk too much about it, and I always keep on reading about it in the alternative media. So do you know about thorium energy? And yeah. Can you explain it? Yeah, it's basically, uh, it sounds too good to be true, but it does exist, and it it is real. Uh, basically, it was uh, in the beginning of the Cold War is when it was discovered, and the U.S. had to make, uh, the U.S. had to make a decision, should they invest in nuclear or thorium? Well, Fortunately for thorium, this is one of the reasons I like it, is it doesn't have explosive materials in it, and it doesn't, it can't really blow things up. It's basically like the safe version of nuclear energy. Uh, and so the U.S. government decided, you know, Cold War, we want to blow things up, uh, to go in the direction of nuclear energy instead of thorium. Now, with uh, our energy problems more uh, prevalent than ever, I think thorium will make a comeback. Uh, in the 50s, we still produced a good amount of oil with production increased, increasing. We, uh, we were just building roads, so we didn't really understand the demand that was going to come. And so they went towards, they gravitated towards nuclear because they probably figured with nuclear and oil we'd be fine. But now it's obvious uh, we want, we need other forms of energy to be energy independent. And I think thorium will do that. The the thorium, the size of a golf ball. If you take thorium, the amount that's in a golf ball, that's enough energy to power a person for the rest of their life. There's uh, if there's enough thorium in the U.S. to power the U.S. for a thousand years, and there's enough thorium in the world to power the Earth for 500 years, and it's yeah it's basically the safe version of nuclear. It disposes waste really quickly and easily. It's cheap. It's abundant. It's abundant, and it's. I personally think it's the energy of the future. Don't run to your broker yet because not many people know about it. Uh, one of the reasons I think is uh, a lot of heads, a lot of big wigs would go out of business. I think wind and solar, I think, would completely go out of business uh, because they're only economic through subsidies. And if they and if thorium became big, people would advocate for thorium, and wind and solar would just be completely done away with, I think. Uh, big oil would definitely, I don't know if it would go out of business, but it definitely lose a lot of its market share. Uh, nuclear reactors would definitely get hit hard. Uh, so I would, I, I would say a lot of powerful people would lose a lot if thorium became mainstream. So I think, uh, I can't exactly prove it, but part of me wonders if it's trying to be suppressed right now. So uh, that's why I think a lot of people don't know about it and why the mainstream press will not talk about it. They don't want to rock the boat too much. Yeah, I've heard all these conspiracy theories about thorium and other alternative energy sources, and you don't hear it on the mainstream media. You only could find it on sites like yours. But what I'm trying to say is that there are some videos that I've seen, and like you've said, some powerful heads, they don't want this energy source out there. And I believe that some of the big oil companies have bought out the patents of some alternative energy sources, which are much more cleaner than what we have. Would you agree with this? And do you know anything about these stories or no? Uh, in terms of big oil and the alternative energy, do you mean big oil and the just thorium or alternative uh, energy? Uh, thorium, alternative energy sources, and in general. Oh, yeah, definitely. They are trying to trans... Uh, uh, what was that? They're trying to transition into uh, alternative energy. Uh, Exxon has made huge investments in uh, algae oil. Chevron's making investments in geothermal. Shell's making investments in uh, gas to liquids plants. Uh, big oils definitely. Uh, they see that. They see the cheap, easy oil 
is sort of running out, they see that uh, they're going to need numerous types of uh, different types of energy to survive. Uh, Schlum Schlumberger, they're making tons of investment in uh, other forms of, uh, of energy production, uh, geothermal for one. So, yeah, there is definitely uh, BP is uh, making investment in hydrofuels. Uh, so there's definitely, they're definitely big oil. It's not a conspiracy theory. They are tra sort of transitioning towards other forms of energy. Uh, one of it is they won't be hated. Uh, alternative energy is very popular. People want to see it come. So uh, thorium, uh, I don't see, too, most people don't know about it. Uh, very few people know about it. There is a couple of companies that do thorium. Uh, I know China's making investments in thorium now. Uh, I think their first thorium plant, they estimate it's supposed to be up and running by 2020, which is a long way off. There needs a, a lot of investment that needs to be made to get it to be mass produced. Uh, and China and Asia is leading the way. Unfortunately, it was invented here in the U.S., but we're not leading it. We should be leading it, but we're not. So I would say China uh, they are, and the Chinese energy companies are making investments in thorium. So, Yeah, I wanted to dive into this topic of uranium and I know we've talked about this off the air and basically you say that after 2012 this year uranium prices should go up and our buddy Jason Barak says the same thing because there is a limited resource of uranium it's a finite resource so can you explain more about why you think uranium prices should be on the rise after uh, this year oh yeah definitely First off, it's uh, the megatons, megawatts program. If people don't know what that is, it's basically after the Cold War collapsed, we worked out a deal with Russia where they extract uranium and sell it to us below market price. Uh, that contract runs up at the end of this year. So not only is uranium go up, but go going to go up, but expect to see at least the increase – there is cheap natural gas, so uh, expect to see at least some increase in uh, your electricity bill because the uranium isn't going to be cheap anymore. Uh, I don't see Russia doing us any favors anymore. One of the reasons is Putin did say U.S. was the world's parasite economy. Uh, I don't know if he was pandering to win an election or whatnot, or did he actually mean it, or maybe a little of both, but... The thing is, Putin, to order, in order to have a balanced budget, he needs high, high energy prices. Oil and gas, I think it was somewhere, definitely way over 100. And if someone promised that many social programs, I doubt that they're going to be selling uranium way below spot market price. There's, uh, there is some uh, scarcity and shortages in the uranium market. So I would say... Uranium prices will go up. The basic supply and demand, the end of the megatons, megawatts program, will drive up thorium. Uh, not thorium, your uh, uranium energy. And not only that, demand is going to be up big. In fact, Japan has approved is uh, on its way to approving the uh, restarting of two nuclear power plants, Fukushima. You know, this is, I don't, it's it's a year, a year after, I don't even think a year after, or yeah, a year after Fukushima, they are starting up their uh, nucle nuclear power plants or, or, or on their way to doing it. So uh, Japan doesn't seem to let, Fuku seem to let Fukushima deter them. Uh, China is making massive investments in uh, urine and nuclear power. They're supposed to bring a uh, a ton of uh, nuclear power plants online this decade. So demand will kick up for uh, nuclear energy. 
the U.S., for the first time, I think since the 1950s, has approved two nuclear power plants to be built uh, in, in Georgia. And demand will pick up. The megatons, megawatts subsidy will to U.S., the largest consumer of uranium in the world, will be out, will be gone. So, you know, with the dollar devaluation thrown in there, uranium will go up drastically. So, and not only that, if people want electric cars that can compete with uh, petroleum-fueled vehicles, it's going to be uranium uh, energy that would fuel it. But the thing about electric cars is I actually think those are a pipe dream. I don't think they can be built for at least another five years. So the main reason is the power grid's dangerously overloaded uh, in a lot of places, uh, not just the U.S., but U.K. and Germany. And in order to get a whole fleet of electric vehicles, they're going to have to make uh, expensive and costly upgrades to their uh, electric power grid. But China seems to be making those type of upgrades in places with Asia. So it does seem plausible in that in the Eastern Hemisphere. So what do you think would happen to prices in, let's say, a hyperinflationary environment or a stagflationary environment? Would they just continue to rise? Because my understanding is, yeah, these contracts are most likely priced in dollars, but at the same time, there wouldn't be that much demand if you had, let's say, a full-blown currency crisis or if you had all these people struggling to make payments on essential items. So what's your take on that? Uh, I would say they would still go up drastically for numerous reasons. Uh, hyperinflation, uh, when I read uh, about Weimar Germany, when money dies, and the last phase of hyperinflation, the stock market crashed. A lot of things uh, crashed. It wasn't just uh, sort of the beginning melt-up mode. It wasn't like the beginning melt-up mode where everything went up. Uh, you know, everything in the equities market went down, except for, you know, physical bullion and everything. Uh, I don't foresee complete hyperinflation, but these prices will go up, uh, I think, in a hyperinflation, because Weimar hyperinflation, if U.S. has hyperinflation, I think, like Weimar, when a powerful nation has it, it generally will lead to, lore, would lead to war, historically speaking. And, the, and you need nuclear power to blow things up. Uh, so I think it would still go up drastically. Uh, so that's one thing. In a hyperinflation, it would also, not only that, not all money is going to be flowing into bullion. You know, no one's going to be willing to get rid of their bullion. Silver uh, is, uh, there's a lot of shortages in silver, supply and demand-wise. Gold, uh, the grades aren't all that great. Some people are talking about peak gold. So not all the money would, fl if you ask me, would flow into gold and silver. I think some would flow into energy, oil, uranium. Uh, I wouldn't say coal because government has really put a target on the coal industry. And it's not just Obama. I watched an interview with Chris Christie, and he says he's opposed to coal power plants being built, which I think you know, ludicrous. I'm for let let the energy companies duke it out and the consumer decides which form's the best. But not I don't think all the money would flow into gold and silver because I don't think there's enough and everyone will be chasing to get rid of their dollars and rather it's gold, silver, you know, if not gold and silver, the next best thing is energy. Secure uh energy supplies so you can rebuild your country. So I think even in hyperinflation, it will go up because if you can't get gold and silver, real money, the next best thing is at least get good energy. Yeah, I agree with that assessment. And before I let you go, how can people follow you and Wall Street for Main Street work? Uh, there's two ways. One, we're on Facebook. And uh, the other is we have our website. It's uh, Wall 
ST for main, ST.com. Street is abbreviated, but we don't have the period. And uh, one more thing is uh, Mo, Jason, and I are working on an oil and gas report, which should be coming out soon. So so uh, I hope your listeners on are on the lookout for that. It's going to be a really good one. We have boatloads of stock picks, one for where it's large cap, small cap, dividend yield. We have it for every uh, style of investor So, in this report. That sounds great. Thanks for coming on, John. Uh, thanks for having me.